Time News Headlines is presented by Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust, serving Micronesia since 1938. Matson and the Adahi Tunnel Program. Cars Plus, home of Guam's first and only lifetime limited powertrain warranty. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurants, always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Coming up on Primetime, the President and First Lady have tested positive for coronavirus. Plus, Guam's governor issues a new executive order lifting more restrictions and allowing for the reopening of certain businesses and activities. And prayers have been answered as indoor church services start up this weekend. Off day, everybody, and good evening. Making news all over the internet was news that President Donald Trump says he and First Lady Melania have tested positive for coronavirus. They got tested after it was learned earlier in the day that one of his top aides, Hope Hicks, had also tested positive. Here's more. One of President Trump's closest aides, Hope Hicks, has tested positive for the coronavirus. Late Thursday, the president tweeted that he and the first lady tested positive for the virus. Hicks, who serves as counselor to President Trump, spent time near the president this week, including aboard Air Force One. So far, Hicks is the closest aide to President Trump to test positive for COVID-19. The White House issued a statement saying, the president takes the health and safety of himself and everyone who works in support of him and the American people very seriously. White House Operations collaborates with the physician to the president and the White House military office to ensure all plans and procedures incorporate current CDC guidance and best practices for limiting COVID-19 exposure to the greatest extent possible, both on complex and when the president is traveling. A White House official tells CBS News contact tracing has been done and the appropriate notifications and recommendations have been made. Nancy Chen, CBS News. Let's get to local news now as Guam's governor has authorized the reopening of more activities and businesses. Now, Guam will remain in pandition condition of readiness level one with the safer at home advisory remaining in effect. But the new executive order lifts further restrictions. National Lakanto explains in this story. Starting Saturday at 8 a.m., social gatherings or congregations of not more than five people are allowed. Places of worship may resume services with no more than 25% capacity. Public parks and beaches and public and private swimming pools will be open for groups of no more than five. And gyms, fitness centers and dance studios are permitted with no more than 25% occupancy. Starting on Monday, October 5th at 6 a.m., child care centers are permitted to operate. And at 8 a.m., organized sports non-contact training will be allowed. The order also notes that individuals and businesses that fail to comply may be subject to fines or the suspension of licenses. The Chamber of Commerce issued a statement stating it's pleased with the lifting of additional restrictions and will continue to seek support for enabling more businesses and industries to open safely with the proper sanitation and safety protocols in place. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Also tonight, our island's faithful had their prayers answered as indoor religious services make their return. Here's Peter Santos. Adeloupe gave the green light for indoor church services effective this Saturday and local church leaders like Pastor Paul Pineda of St. Paul Assembly of God and Pastor Joe Nauta of Calvary Church are ready to welcome their flocks back home. No matter how it went, I think she made the right decision. And so we're happy to do that. And, uh, you know, we're going to take a look and try to make sure that we open up uh, safely. Now uh, it seems like we have a, a go uh, on the third if, if nothing changed up. So I count it as a, as a blessing and um, praise the Lord for that. I'm glad that, uh, you know, it's, we, we got the green light in that sense. As we reported, the Archdiocese of Aganya announced the return of indoor masses to begin this Saturday prior to the governor's official authorization. Pastor Joe Nauta says he wasn't going to wait either, but he's happy to get the governor's blessing to finally open. You know, honestly, and I say this, I don't mean like disrespect, but we really weren't waiting on it, just for the record, you know what I mean? Because we feel like, man, we, we've already got to that point where we, we realized that it do more damage to close the doors of the church, if you will, and the gathering and, and stop being open for the public and the community. But I am glad if, if this is what's really happening and, and nothing's changing up. I am glad. I'm going to count this as a God's grace and a blessing that uh, the church can officially open up now. Church leaders advise those who are particularly vulnerable and those who are exhibiting symptoms to remain at home. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. 
Well, with the new executive order taking effect this weekend, more businesses, parks, and activities are reopening, with public health cautioning that we should all still be concerned. If you open things up, we're probably going to see another surge. That's how these things are patterned. Guam's territorial epidemiologist, Dr. Ann Pabutsky, telling it like it is. On the link this morning, she detailed the troubling comparison of COVID cases between Guam and Hawaii. Guam has, uh, as of the 30th of September, so we have almost 2,500 cases in a population of uh, 168, 169,000 and 49 deaths. Our death rate is 29 Point one per 100,000 population. Our case incidence rate, it's up to September, is 1,478. Hawaii's only 874.2, and we're a lot smaller. In this new version of PCOR-1, Dr. Pobutsky reminds us that the pandemic is far from over. We keep going back to this. It really depends on how the community behaves. If we open things up and everybody just says, oh, great, the pandemic's over, behaves as if and goes to bars and or the bars are still closed. OK, they yeah. go to church, then they start having fiestas and family gatherings, and then we see more and more spread. It really depends on how seriously people take this. Yeah, that but... There still is virus out there. It's spreading. It's in workplaces. We're seeing it in some congregate settings. Um, there's a lot of household spread. Dr. Pobutsky encourages the people of Guam to make the right choices to stay home, stay safe, and save lives. For Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. Well, the latest numbers released by the Joint Information Center late Thursday report that out of the latest 434 samples run at various labs, 62 were positive. This now brings Guam's COVID case to over 2,500 cases, 2,550 to be exact. That's the number of island residents who have been affected with 608 people actively fighting the virus and more than 1,800 having recovered from it. The COVID census over at the Memorial Hospital for today shows 30 COVID patients hospitalized with 13 receiving ICU level of care, eight of which are on ventilators. As we head into the weekend with the new relaxed restrictions, as we've been telling you about, we remind you to continue following the COVID guidelines, wear your mask, Wash your hands, stay socially distant. Prevention does save lives. And thank you. Well, the Health Committee conducted another oversight hearing of the Public Health Department on Thursday, focusing on the status of COVID-19 investigations and contact tracing. Chairperson Senator Therese Terlahi questioned territorial epidemiologist Dan, Dr. Ann Pobutsky about a lack of specific data available to the community. Of, um, COVID-19 on the island. Right now, the public's unable to determine what type of community contact you're talking about here and um correct and we will try and put more detail into the weekly report the type of community contact right which is why we're why we keep asking this question about you know what information can be disclosed because we it's our we're, we're guessing or we're being told that the decisions that are being made as to closures of businesses are based on these data this information from public health. And it's very vague at this point, the way it's being reported to us. Is there any way to at least get that part of the data up, you know, uh, as soon as possible? The community, break down the community contact? Um, not at this time. There's only two of us and we just got someone on board assisting. And like I said, we're migrating all the data into the si data management system and it's just gonna take more time. Dr. Pobutsky says data migration should take another two weeks and a new situation report format could be ready in another month. Well, we've been reporting this for about over a month now, and Public Health is now using the SARA Alert tool, an open source program that automates monitoring and reporting of people exposed to or infected with coronavirus. Individuals using the SARA Alert will be able to update Public Health daily about their health status during the period they're being monitored. This will also be a useful tool for travelers being released to home quarantine. Now, unlike the Guam COVID Alert app, you will not have to download any mobile program, but instead users will be able to communicate directly with public health to report daily symptoms through web, SMS text messaging, email messages, or simply an old school phone call. Well, it has now been over a year in other news and he still has yet to be sentenced, but now former Joint Mayor Jesse Blas and the government have filed a joint request for a status hearing. The former mayor pled guilty to extortion under color of official rights for igno acknowledging drug trafficking through village cluster boxes. He faces a maximum of 20 years in federal prison with Assistant U.S. Attorney Laura Sambataro and Blas Attorney Joseph Rosano submitting the request citing logistical issues regarding his sentencing. A hearing was previously set for the 13th of this month, 
But as stated in the joint motion, both parties plan to discuss the issue with the court in order to reach a resolution prior to sentencing. The issues were not detailed in the court documents. Please stay tuned, everybody. Primetime will continue right after this. 100% truck, 100% Jeep brand. The all-new Jeep Gladiator is the most capable off-road mid-size pickup truck crafted for adventure. Equipped with best-in-class towing capacity, legendary Jeep brand 4x4 capability, and backed by Guam's only lifetime powertrain warranty. Drive home in a brand new Jeep Gladiator today, starting as low as $283 per paycheck during Jeep Adventure Days. Call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to get pre-approved today. It makes myself and it makes my team members very proud to work for an organization that has been on island for many years with its focus on reliability, dependability, and commitment to the communities that they operate in. Matson's a great corporate citizen to the community. We all benefit from any sort of environmental commitment we make. One of the ways that we do that is with our Adahi Utano program. There's action behind it, and so action breeds commitment. With the Kaimana Gila coming to Guam, this brings a new age and modernization to the island. It's exciting for me because it's a brand new ship and we can carry more freight into the island. It just shows growth for Guam and Micronesia. Matson would be nothing without its customers and we hope to continue to serve you for decades to come. KUAM News winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back, everybody. Congressional challenger Dr. Robert Underwood said while he was hoping for a compromise between the House and administration because Guam truly needs the funding, he blasted incumbent delegate Michael Sinicholas for coming out earlier this week in a press conference and raising false expectations. For matching funds for Medicaid. I believe, and I really want to say this uh, uh, clearly, that it was uh, irresponsible on the part of uh, uh, Congressman uh, Mike St. Nicholas to talk about a package that is not yet done. It is irresponsible because it is uh, conveying, uh, it, it really is taking advantage of our anxieties and our concerns and giving us a sense of false hope. Uh, even going into that news conference, you must have known that whatever package was being would be resolved would be far less than what he was talking about. In that conference, Nicholas outlined various aid programs that Guam would benefit from, including more than $1 billion that GovGuam could use for operations. Well, for upperclassmen in high school, college preparatory exercises are usually at the top of the list. Now we're talking about applications, letters of recommendation, and the all-important standard aptitude test. However, that last one, the SAT, a bit harder for kids to check off the list this year. With more on this issue is our Tyler Matanani. Father Joinius is one of the testing sites for the SATs. Typically, outgoing juniors would take the test in May and June and return in the fall to retake the test as seniors. But unfortunately, May and June testing was canceled by COVID. We have a makeup one, oddly enough, in October 10th, and they're asking if we can do that. The college board is asking if we can do that so we can accommodate students who haven't had the opportunity to take it. But they still need the okay from public health. Although FD Principal Ishmael Perez says they've adopted extensive measures to maintain social distancing protocols, he's questioning how non-essential businesses and public gatherings are slowly shifting back amid PCOR 1. And yet they still haven't gotten the green light. This is getting really time sensitive. This is um, application season. And our seniors, you know, I don't know what next year will look like. Even though it's test optional in a lot of places now, that might be the one piece that actually sets them over the bar to get accepted and even maybe a scholarship that otherwise wouldn't have been available with the GPA they presented. So it's, it's all about you know providing the students an opportunity. It's important to note that the FD campus is not an FD only test site, but serves the entire community as well as students from off island. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Tyler Matsunani. Thanks so much, Tyler. In other news tonight, is the Education Financial Supervisory Commission necessary moving forward? That's the very question the Guam Department of Education is bringing to the attention of the legislature. As the agency's Budget and Finance Committee expressed in their latest meeting, the entity is no longer needed. 
when Superintendent John Fernandez saying the commission was created to manage the financial health and monitor any financial distress the agency may encounter due to funding shortfalls. He also says the commission was created right around the same time the third-party fiduciary requirement was designated by Uncle Sam, and given the GDOE's progress, it's become an unnecessary entity. If this entity were, in fact, uh, a way to ensure communication because we're having a hard time communicating, or if this is the group that is to advocate for our cash release or for a bigger budget or for whatever it is, that might be uh, helpful. But at this stage, we already have day-to-day -day interactions with DOA, with BBMR, with the legislature as needed, with, you know, we have that day-to-day. -day. The Education Board held a special meeting this afternoon, unanimously passing the resolution that approves the Commission's report for fiscal year 2020. In other news, Marine Corps Base Camp Blas has now officially been activated, as you now know. It's an administrative action that marks the initial operations capacity of the base, which is the newest base to open since 1952. Now, of course, Camp Blas is named after Guam's beloved General Vicente Blas, otherwise known as Ben Blas, the first Chamorro general and four-term congressman from Guam. We spoke with his eldest son, Tom, a former anchorman here at KUAM. I'm sure he's happy right now uh, up in heaven, having uh, um, maybe having a beer with uh, his three brothers and sisters that are up there. And, uh, you know, his greatest love was uh, Notre Dame and the Marine Corps. And, uh, and he loved the Congress as well. But uh, I think number one was, was the Marines. And uh, being a base on Guam, you know, given the, the, the way everything is shifted to the Pacific and, and uh, getting the recon or the expeditionary Marines here, uh, I think he'd, he'd be very proud. Tom says his father's endless love for the Corps developed when he was a young teen, right after Guam's liberation in World War II. He often told me about, uh, you know, the, the, the soldiers that, or the Marines that had uh, helped him and given him uh, uh, encyclopedias and told him to listen to the radio, uh, listen to news, listen to songs. And, and uh, they, he said they, they were very influential in him, you know, getting enough grasp of the English language to, to get the scholarship to Notre Dame uh, from the bishop. After college in South Bend, General Blas served a well-decorated 29-year career in the Marines, followed by eight years as Guam's congressional delegate. A formal activation ceremony of Camp Blas is scheduled for next year. Our congratulations to Tom and the Blas family. Very well deserved. Well, the Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence and Other News held the annual Silent Witness Ceremony in honor of those who suffered in silence. So Here's you see Mike red silhouettes of individuals yeah. around the island um, at businesses or churches. These are the voices or the, the persons that have given up their lives because of DV and SA, uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. And so please remember all those who have died. Heart. And if there's anything to celebrate this During the ceremony, the governor signed a proclamation at, with October as Family Violence Awareness Month. Family violence affects not only those who are abused, but it also affects other family members, most especially children who grow up in a violent home. She also went on to add, uh, although GPD stats show a decrease in family violence inference from 1,300 in 2016 to just over 1,000 in 2019, the number remains unacceptable. The virtual event can be rewatched on the Silent Witness Guam page on Facebook. And in election news, voting continues tomorrow over at the home of the geckos at GW High in Mingilao starting at 9 and ending at 4 in the afternoon. It'll be a first-come, first-served basis with no appointments needed to cast your ballot, and voting is open to all villages, even if you don't live in Mingilao. The Election Commission is roving the island, giving voters who are homebound the chance to vote from home. You can simply call 477-9791, and you can coordinate with the GEC to make sure that your voice is properly heard. Guam Election Commission Executive Director Maria Pangolinan gives you the breakdown on what you'll need. 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock, Bring your ID, wear your mask, bring a black or blue pen, vote early, vote safe, be the Guam. For more information, check out the GEC online at gec.guam.gov. Well, coming up, we're going to highlight one of the island's outstanding educators in this week's Touch of Glass virtual edition.
your community calendars brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live moss. While we've all been through a lot over the years, typhoons, earthquakes, and now COVID-19, we've been able to get through these together. For more than 80 years, Apple's insurance has been protecting your homes, your businesses, and the health of your family. We are here today and we'll be here tomorrow. There are better days ahead. Tomorrow's a new day filled with hope and choices. The possibilities of what we can achieve together are limitless. Let's continue to work together to ensure a brighter tomorrow for all of us. This week's featured Outstanding Island Educator for our virtual learning is Amanda Todd of Harvest Christian Academy. Today, Jonah Gancharfritz here, and for this week's Touch of Class Virtual Learning Edition, I have with me Amanda Todd from Harvest Christian Academy. Hafiday, Amanda. Hi, Joan. Nice to meet you. Same here. So first off, why don't you tell us um, the subject that you teach at Harvest Christian Academy? Yeah, I teach a ninth grade geography and 12th grade government and economics. Wow. Those so. are my favorite courses back in high school. Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. Yay. <laughs> I like to hear that. I oh. like having both ends of the spectrum. It's fun. <laughs> well, you know, with everything going on, um, a lot of the classes, a lot of schools have kind of shifted online. And for that, teachers have had to adjust their teaching styles. What have you had to do? Well, uh, there's definitely been a lot of adjustments, but probably the biggest adjustment that I've had to make is restructuring my special days. Mm -hmm. So when we're in person normally, about every month or so, I try to like kind of like create this whole big room transformation. And it's just like to get the kids totally engaged and involved on like every, with all of their senses. So the room's redecorated. Uh, it's like an activity that's rigorous, but still fun. And it's all themed. And I usually try to pair this, they don't really know this, but I try to pair it with the boring or hard concepts. <laughs> the ones that we struggle to like really get engaged to, I kind of overcompensate for it, but it's always a lot of fun. And, um, and I've done things like a medical theme and we dissect the constitution or data and donut fair. And it's not, this concept isn't original to me. It's from a book called uh, Be the Wild Card by Wade and Hope King. It's a really great book. I'd recommend it, but um, I've gotten the idea from there and I thoroughly enjoy doing them. But being online, it's not as much a possibility. It's a lot harder to engage everybody's, like all the senses uh, when you're teaching. But I did try, I tried one kind of transformation um, for our international day a week or two ago. So normally all of us, we like all dress up and it's a lot of fun, but we didn't, we couldn't do that so much. They could still dress up if they wanted, but we decided to try a bake along mm -hmm. um, since, Food and culture go hand in hand, right? I mean, we know that. We live on Guam. Definitely. Yeah, so we try to bake along with my seniors. I tried it with the seniors. Um, and so they had three options. They could either do the homemade brownie recipe with me. And I, we all had our videos on and we were all cooking together. Or they could be making like uh, box brownies or whatever they had in their fridge. That was the second option, just to be cooking while we're all together. And then the third option was just in case, you know, someone didn't have that possibility. Uh, they were our sports commentators, kind of, and they were commenting on all of our videos and our cooking and keeping up the conversation. And um, that was the first time I tried any kind of transform room transformation on Zoom. And it was it was really fun. It was a good time to re uh, like connect with my students in a little bit of a different way. And then we all had brownies. So you know it was a good Friday. <laughs> so. One of the things I wanted to ask too is um, um, how your, your kids are, are doing. Obviously, you know, having to deal with what is going on currently with, with COVID and, and then having mm -hmm. to make this change teaching and learning online. Um, how have they been doing through this all? You know, uh, overall, I've been really thoroughly impressed with my students. This has been a challenge in like self-discipline and organizational skills for a lot of them. But even though there are there there have been moments of growing pains, <clears throat> um, 
they really are persevering and they are trying their best. And I know this will make them stronger students and adults in the future. Um, so I'm so proud of them. They, they have really been trying. They've been troopers, their families as well. The family's dedication has been amazing and they've been so supportive, the parents have uh, with the kids and with like us. So their sacrifice does not go unnoticed because I know this is hard for everyone at home. Um, but the kids like keep up the great work. They've been doing a great job of putting in the effort. And is there anything that you want to get out to the community um, about about everything? You know, um, I know that teachers, the, the whole thing of teaching parents getting a taste of it, having to do, you know, to to teach their kids a little bit at, uh, while they were we were all stuck in lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want to get out to our viewers? Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, um, I guess I just want to like remind our community about when it comes to teaching online. This is a hardship for students and teachers. It's not our norm, but it is a sacrifice we're willing to make for the safety of our community. Um, I think history is great to show this, like this isn't the first time that kids have had to go through a hard time. We think even back to like World War II, kids were involved in victory, guarding, uh, victory gardens, uh, collecting rubber, um, rations, things like that. Um, and or even just like leaving their home in England, right, to go live in the countryside away from their parents. So kids have taken up the banner to help their communities before and our students being online right now is the student and teacher version of helping our community as much as we can. So I would say, you know, this is still a hardship. So remember your students and your kids and your teachers because this isn't their norm and it is a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice we're willing to make for our community. This is how we can serve our community. Um, and we know it's not forever because history tells us that it's pretty cyclical. So we know it's not forever. So we're willing to put in and do our part for the community. So stay strong, Guam. <laughs> Well put, well put. But thank you so much, Amanda, and keep up the fantastic work that you're doing. And above all, stay safe. Thanks. You too, Joan. Thanks for having me. And now, here's your Friday birthday shoutouts. All right, everybody, it's the 10th month of the year and the second day of that month, so we got three birthday celebrants. See, it's all about math here on KUAM. So, happy birthday on October 2nd to George Flores. Happy birthday to my husband, coming from your loving wife, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. George, we hope you have a fantastic day, my friend. Sherry Ann Flores Piercing. Happiest birthday, Sherry, and we hope you have a wonderful day. We love you, Bula. Sadie Piercing and Tatao Tao families. And Aunt Therese Guerrero blows out the candles today, so happy birthday, Mom. Thank you for everything you do for us. Praying for many more birthdays to come. Love always, your kids. Three extra special Guamanians, three people that deserve the love from their family and friends, and that includes each and every one of us in Guamanians. So, to each of you, to George, to Sherry, and to Anne, have a happy, happy birthday. There's about 168,000 Guamanians on the island right now, so that means we want to feature 168,000 birthday shoutouts, and we will. All you got to do is register on KUAM.com and click on birthdays to do so, because one every week could win a Cold Stone Creamery ice cream cake. Let's meet this week's winner. This week's winner is Josephine Peretta, otherwise known as JJ. Hey, JJ, congratulations. You are the new owner of a ice cream cake, courtesy of our friends at Cold Stone Creamery, and we will be in touch with you very, very soon to let you know how you can safely redeem your prize. Happy birthday once again from Cold Stone Creamery and KUAM. Have a great island week. All right, everybody, things are starting to reopen around the island, but please only go out if you absolutely need to. Let's stay sharp, stay smart, stay healthy, stay respectful. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time.